Namo arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <coughs> So today we are going to look at a little sutta that some people really like this. And I, I used to find it really confusing. I think I read it six times yesterday, <laughs> you know, and it's like you need a pen and paper because to keep it straight, to keep this straight, I, I read it slowly. It's a short sutta. Um, this one is called The Ant Hill. And uh, it is called the Vamika Sutta, Majime Nikaya number 23. It is short, it is very much a lesson, and it has little parts in it. And uh, it's like a riddle. And so uh, what's happening here, is there a certain deity that comes down a beautiful in appearance, illuminating the whole of the blind men's grove? and approaches the venerable Kumara Kasapa. You know, there were five Kasapas. You want some confusion in Buddhism. <laughs> there were five, five Kasapas that were related that were all monks. They weren't in the same family, uh, but this was this name that everybody wanted to be a Kasapa, you know? <laughs> and and um, there was the Maha Kasapa, and this one is, uh, this one is, Kumara Kasapa. And the first time someone told me that, I went, I never considered there'd be like so many, but then I have the same name, you know, but then, you know, I was around the Chinese and in Malaysia, there was this going on, you know, and then um, there was also uh, reading the stories in the, in the book. Sometimes I would run into this, but I wasn't prepared for five of them in the stories, you know, anyway. Let's do this. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindicus Park. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Kumara Kasapa was living in the blind men's grove. And then when the night was well advanced, probably after midnight, a certain deity of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of the blind men's grove approached the venerable Kumara Kasapa and stood at one side. And so standing, the deity then said to him, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu, this anthill fumes by night and flames by day. So the first thing we have is the anthill. It fumes at night and flames in the day. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Delve with the knife. Dig, dig with the knife. Thou wise one, delving with the knife, the wise man, the wise one saw a bar, a bar, O venerable sir. And thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the bar, delve with the knife, thou wise man. Delve, delving with the knife, the wise one saw a toad, a toad. No venerable sir. So now we have a toad. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the toad. Delve with the knife, thou wise man. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a fork. A fork. Oh, venerable sir. Do you feel like you're at the birthday party yet? 
<laughs> you go to the birthday party when you're young and they put all the things on the tray and you have to look at it and then remember as many as you can. <laughs> That's what this always reminds me of. So now we have a fork, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the fork, delve with the knife, thou wise man. Delving with the knife, the wise man saw a sieve, a sieve, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the sieve, delve with the knife, thou wise man. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a tortoise. A tortoise, O oh, venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the tortoise, delve with the knife, thou wise one. And delving with the knife, the wise one saw a butcher's knife and block. A butcher's knife and block, O oh, venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the butcher's knife and block. Now delve with the knife, thou wise man. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a piece of meat. A piece of meat, O venerable sir. And thus spoke the Brahmin throw out the piece of meat, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a Naga serpent. A Naga serpent, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, leave the Naga serpent, do not harm, the Naga serpent, honor the Naga serpent. Bhikkhu, you should go to the Blessed One and ask him about this riddle. As the Blessed One tells you, so you should remember it. Bhikkhu, other than the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata, or one who has learned it from them. I see no one in this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, or in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people, whose explanation of this riddle might satisfy the mind. That is what was said by the deity, and thereupon vanished at once. And then the night was over. The venerable Kumara Kasapa went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side, and he told the Blessed One what had occurred. And then he asked him, Venerable Sir, what is the anthill? What the fuming by night? What the flaming by day? Who is the Brahmin? Who is the wise man? What is the knife? What the delving? What the bar? What the toad, what the fork, what the sieve, what the tortoise, what the butcher's knife and block, what the piece of meat, and what the snaga serpent. Bhikkhu. The anthill is a symbol for this body. 
made of material form consisting of four great elements, and it is procreated by the mother and father, built up out of boiled rice and porridge. It is subject to impermanence, to being worn and rubbed away, to dissolution and disintegration. What one thinks and ponders on by night, based upon one's actions during the day, is the fuming by night. So whatever you do in the day depends on how you sleep that night. Will you rest and sleep? Or will you have no peace? It's sort of an instant karma statement, isn't it? <laughs> what you think and ponder on during the day. And ponder by night based on one's uh, actions during the day. That's the fuming at night. So your mind doesn't rest. This is the cause and effect of how you live and keep your eightfold path in the day and what happens to you at night with your sleep. The actions one undertakes during the day by body, speech, and mind after thinking and pondering it by night, then that is the flaming by day. And so if you're restless at night and you're thinking, 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 or concerned, and what did we say about this happening is the disturbance, continuous lamentation and turning over of what happened in the past, or the worry, worry, worry of the future. That's what we talked about. So we talked about this square with the little car and you're driving the car. And as you're steering the car, you're staying in the present time. And that's it. Present time is moving, 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 moving across, right? It's moving across in life from birth all the way over to death. And you stay in the little car, you're okay. <laughs> as long as you close the trunk. Okay, close the trunk. If you don't close the trunk, you're going to put stuff in the trunk and carry it with you and worry, worry, worry. That's it. So remember to close the trunk. I can draw the little car pretty well. Everybody's witnessed that, but I always mess up with the trunk. It just has to have to close the trunk. The actions one takes during the day by body, speech, and mind, after thinking and pondering by night, that becomes the flaming day. That's how that works. The Brahman is a symbol for the Tathagata, the teachings, the teachings. And accomplished and fully enlightened, the wise one is a symbol. The wise one becomes a symbol for the bhikkhu in higher training. And the knife is a symbol for noble wisdom. It means we keep the delving is a symbol for the arousing of energy for what? Energy for mindfulness, investigation, energy for joy, for tranquility, for concentration, for equanimity, for going down the path and developing those enlightenment factors all the way down the path. That's what you're doing. That's a big thing about energy. It's not, it has so many mentions. You know, if uh, we drew out the 37 requisites on a board, we would see energy repeated here and there. We would see mindfulness repeated here and there. And uh, there's a couple others that keep turning up again and again. Yeah, those are the ones we need to pay attention to. The knife is a symbol of noble wisdom, and the delving is a symbol of the arousing of your energy. 
Now, the bar is a symbol for ignorance. The bar is the symbol for ignorance. Throw out the bar and abandon the ignorance. Don't fight with it. Useless. Don't fight with it. This is where we always talk about the hindrances. The big misunderstanding, and I always look at this and I say, well, we're raised completely on the Majima Nikaya, heavy, heavy, heavy. If you leave the teachings that are in the suttas and start depending on commentaries, somewhere, I don't know when, they decided the hindrances are the enemy. You know, and we have to fight them. We've got to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suffocate them, subdue them, stop them at all costs, personally make them stop. Otherwise, we can't do anything. We can't accomplish anything. And this prolific message has destroyed basic progress down the path. Just destroyed it. Because the moment I decide to make something other than what is, is what's happening. I am denying uh, Anicca. Anicca is our friend. We say it's our enemy. It makes us discontent because of change. Well, that's true. Okay, but at the same time, we can flip over Anicca and say, however, whatever is going on will cease and change. That's what the universe is telling you. So this makes Anicca... Uh, an interesting piece because a lot of times it's emphasized as the devil and causing everything, but it's not necessarily just the devil. And it takes a student to come to me and say, you know, Anicca is my friend because whatever was happening, I knew it was going to change. If I just waited, everything would change. There you are. That's not a bad thing. So you, you don't have to be stuck think that you're stuck because everything is moving and going along like this and it's changing and changing and changing. So we can sit back and watch change as it's going on. Doesn't mean that you don't uh, uh, do something about something that's wrong in the community or something, you know, there's a wrong law and it needs to be changed. Doesn't mean that you don't support change that way. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that in general, don't take a Nietzsche to just think of it as uh, being wrong because it's a two-sided one. It's, a, it's like the word Chanda. Chanda, in the old dictionaries, I told you, the really old dictionaries, was wholesome desire. But then in the newer dictionaries and teaching, a lot of people think Chanda is unwholesome desire. But wait a second, Chanda was a neutral word and it flips over to the situation it's in to get used. So it's not that it, it's unwholesome or it's both. It's, it's wholesome or unwholesome depending on the situation it's in. We like Chanda. Chanda is a wholesome desire to continue your practice, a wholesome desire to keep on the Eightfold Path, a wholesome desire to keep your precepts. All these pieces are the Chanda on the positive side. Okay, now here after abandon ignorance, delve with the nice, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The toad is a symbol for anger and irritation. Throw out the toad, abandon anger and irritation. So see abandonment, there you go. Anger and irritation is your hindrance group, your new arena. Now we're getting down to most of the messages. You can only find a few places in the text that tells you to do what some of the commentaries are saying, are talking about, because actually the message for the hindrance management is to abandon it. So how do you abandon something? Well, let's see, I had something here a minute ago. Um, you know, well, use a little partner. So 
I have this, I put it in my hand. And if I want to abandon it, I abandon it. <laughs> I, abandoned. I abandoned it. You see, I just turn around and walk away from it. Empty it up, leave it alone and just keep going watching. I just abandon it. There's not a lot of effort in abandonment. Why is abandonment so important with a hindrance is because if we go into certain places, but we hear throughout the text, abandon, 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 abandon. Uh, there's one in uh, Majima Nikaima 128, Upap Kalesa Sutta, talks about 11 different hindrances, the five principal ones and the offshoots of those. And in the end of it, the last paragraph is saying the statement, when I saw that such and such was an imperfection of mind, I abandoned it. That's what the Buddha is telling the monks he did as the answer for the hindrances. He abandoned them. Keep this in mind because the interesting part is that we find out that there's nutriment or food that makes a hindrance work, makes it operate. In order to keep the hindrance alive and well, needs to have food. And the food for the hindrance is my personal attention. My personal attention to that hindrance makes like an obstacle become an obstruction. This is in 22 in the Alagadupama Sutta. He says to them, how many times have you heard me say that an obstacle can only become an obstruction if you engage in it? That means pay attention to it. Oh boy. So my attention is the food for the hindrance which is the reason why the ultimate solution was simply to ignore it and abandon it. Because what happens if I decide to do personally, destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, suffocate it, suppress it, and subdue it? Atta is involved in that. Is this not true? Yeah, this is what's Here we're back. We have to wait a little bit, see if people come back. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a lot of things going with our electrical company here this week and the, and the connections. Okay, the toad is a symbol for anger and irritation. So we're talking about the hindrances. And I think what we were talking about was food for the hindrances and understanding, always remembering that the practice of the meditation, part of the intention of this is to let go of Atta, not completely, but to understand that everything is not, is not, um, this is really irritating, wait a minute. Everything is not uh, personal. And if you believe that everything is personal, this is how Atta is working. If you believe everything is personal and you have to take charge of everything, control everything, your life becomes tremendously heavy. And also, if you take things personally, somebody comes up in your face and yells at you, your immediate reaction is defense, defensive position, strike back. Ex, you know, explain all the rest of it. It's unnecessary. So what is the difference between doing that and looking at it impersonally? How can I do that if somebody's putting me down and yelling at me? And tell the young people, you know, one of the things, when somebody's yelling at you, if you know them at all, you can usually figure out this person is not yelling at me. He's actually yelling at himself or herself if you listen to them. If, if it's a person where you work, you know, you see them every day, watch the person. Pretty soon you understand. You understand they're not yelling at me. They're yelling at themselves. So when they're finished, the best thing 
He said, go for tea or go for coffee, get a donut, or if it's in America, take them to get ice cream. Yeah. And just listen to what's going on in their life. Befriend them enough that you can find out what's really going on or watch the situation, but you'll begin to understand it's not about me. It's actually about them. So that's number one. And number two is that you have a choice about what you're seeing and hearing, but what you're seeing in front of you, if you're with a person, if somebody does this on the internet, it's a little harder, but if you're seeing the person personally, you, you can begin to understand this person is in pain if they are yelling at you. So what is happening for them? What does that mean to you? You can put a different positioning on this situation. In other words, you can look at them with compassion and see a person that's in pain. And the pain is their pain, not yours. It's their pain. You cannot take this pain away from them. I can't take yours. You can't take mine away. So what is compassion is seeing the person in pain and understanding it's their pain. You can't take it away. But what you can do is love them unconditionally. What does that mean? It means let them have the space they need to go through their painful time, help them to be comfortable, help them have enough water, stay warm, that sort of thing but don't take what's happening personally because after all, whatever's happening, we go past that and we're in another empty spot of the present time and the present time keeps changing all the time. Right? So you're in charge. So a lot of Buddhism is about, I don't understand. I'm still trying to figure out how anybody can say Buddhism is pessimistic. I don't understand (laughs) because my whole entire life completely changed when I found Buddhism. Because here was the Buddha talking about all this stuff and how he figured out what, how everything actually works. And then in this day and time, it's actually a wonderful thing to, to learn Buddhism, but I'm not saying you should become Buddhist. That sounds funny. Don't tell me. (laughs) here I am a nun, but I'm not proselytizing. I'm not trying to get you to be Buddhist. I'm trying to get you to see how your mind works. That's what I'm doing. And I don't care if you're a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, you're pink, black, blue, green. I don't care what you are. I don't care if you're a gorilla. I don't care if you're a bird. But if I can get you to see enough clearly, you won't be in pain anymore. So it's a game of opening the mind and using the brain to the full potential. And the way to do that is to eliminate uh, the past and eliminate the future and be only dealing with a present time block that is moving along in life like this, moving along in life as things are happening, leaving the past where does that go? The past. <laughs> past. See, it's, it's the opposite for me. <laughs> I think I have the mirror thing on. <laughs> but the past, letting the past stay in the past and the future stay in the future. Do you see my problem? <laughs> okay. And then when you're only dealing in the present time, there's not any weight on you. You can look at a situation one thing at a time. So what does this do to the student at school? It takes them from a D to an A within about a month, you know, only a month's time. If you explain it to them basically enough and you're not their parent standing there saying, you have to do better, (laughs) you know, you're not, you're just explaining to them how this works, you know, you read the assignment, then you, you treat the assignment the way Chonky Suta tells you to. If you want to understand how to be the best student with the teacher and get the highest grades, you show them the Chanki Sutta 
and the 12 steps are there for the perfect relationship with the teacher and success of the topic or the subject. It's right there. You see, we've talked about that before. And um, I've had people take that sutta and de buddhize it, you know, take the Buddhism out of it and present it to freshmen coming into a college. And uh, these freshman orientation was the best one that they ever had. The students really knew what they needed to do to succeed. And it wasn't float through school. It wasn't like that, but it was, it was organized and it was fun and it was disciplined and it showed you exactly how each part of the step of what to do was related to the last one. It was a causal relationship. And people have done that very many times with me in college level and just dropped the bad grades and picked up and really gone forward just by organizing themselves. What am I supposed to do here? Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Have respect, visit the teacher, uh, you know, pay attention to nothing except the lecture when you're listening, turn your phones off. Uh, after you listen, you take notes. After you take notes, you actually read them. <laughs> you know, and then after you read the notes, you make little um, little cards and you scrutinize. You memorize the best parts and memorize it and roll it in your mind, and then you scrutinize it carefully. So all these steps are there. It was twelve little steps. Really nice. Okay, next one here, the toad. Well, the toad was anger and irritation. Throw out the toad, abandon the anger and irritation, delve with the knife, thou wise men. And this is the meaning to that. Now the fork is a symbol for doubt. Delve, throw out the fork, sorry. Throw out the fork, abandon doubt. And that is echoed in all of the places where doubt is met. It's a mount store. You hear doubt in the suttas, always abandon doubt. Delve with the knife, thou wise man. This is the meaning. The sieve, the sieve is a symbol for the five hindrances, namely the hindrances of sensual desire, lust and greed, the hindrance of ill will, Hatred and aversion is what that is. The hindrance of sloth and torpor, we're talking about a sleepy, dull mind. The hindrance of restlessness and guilt and remorse, that's the third one, the fourth one, and the hindrance of doubt. So these five pieces throw out the sieve, abandon the five hindrances. You see, when you have the sieve, you're sifting them. It means when the hindrance comes up, oh, what is that? Oh, where did that come from? Why are you here bothering my meditation? Let's talk about when that happened. <laughs> you know, and you get involved with whoever's in the sieve. So throw away the sieve and remember that when these come up and you feel the tension change in your body and mind, that you immediately recognize that. You never mind it, let go of it, relax, smile, and come back. Let go, relax, smile, come back. That's it. That's the whole practice. Delve with a knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. Now, next one. The tortoise is a symbol for the five aggregates affected by clinging. This is one of my favorite expressions, affected by clinging. Now, always when you see aggregates and clinging, always remember it's when affected by clinging that's a problem. It's not saying aggregates are bad. Body, feeling, perception, thoughts, consciousness. Nothing in the text says an arahat has to just go to sleep and not See, hear, smell, taste, touch, or mention anything ever again. Buddha was a good conversationalist. He was a good teacher. He taught for 45 years. I promise you he didn't disappear when he became a Buddha. <laughs> and somebody said, I can't become an Arahat. I would just disappear. I'm there. Give me a break. 
he was teaching. He had a lot to do, 84,000 suttas. <laughs> I worked all this out one time. You know, May, we ought to actually do that. I ought to bring you, write that out again and bring it. It was took a whole weekend to write it out. The question was, is it really possible this man taught 84,000 suttas? <laughs> so we got in a, in a snowstorm once. I spent my time <laughs> trying to figure out how many hours he was alive from the point of being a Buddha until he died. <laughs> okay, And I wanted to break down every day how much time did he allow, according to the Padimokha and everything, how much time did he allow to get up and walk and go to alms and come back and eat his breakfast and clean up the refectory? How long did it take him to clean up where he was, he was sleeping? It doesn't take much time at all, you know? <laughs> okay. And then how much time did he sit maybe in the day? Because he did still sitting. He was still sitting and walking and he was teaching. And then he had, was teaching this. So how many, how could it all work? Anyway, I worked out this whole thing and where he traveled and how long it took to walk from place to place in India. And at the end, I had 190,000 <laughs> 190, hours still left and i was there like obviously he could have done this and we figured the suttas that the average the av the suttas were running through uh the lessons giving him an hour to teach you know each time we so we know there's some short some long and everything but still there was all this time left so I'm, I'm get to thinking about this. He did 84,000 and then the Arahats did another 2,000. So that's your 86,000 suttas they talk about, see? Pretty interesting. <laughs> okay, the tortoise is a symbol for the five aggregates affected by clinging. When affected by clinging, remember that. So you're not in problem city all the time, only when you are involved with clinging. What is clinging? It is the story, the ideas, the imagination, and everything about why I don't like something or don't want it or why I like it and why I want it. That's the craving. And then this is the clinging. Okay. Namely, the material form aggregate affected by clinging. Okay. So this is like body. The feeling aggregate affected by clinging. The perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. Okay. Throw out the tortoise, poor tortoise. <laughs> Abandon the five aggregates affected by clinging. Now the five aggregates are represented on a tortoise by four feet and a head. That was the note. I thought that was pretty good. Four feet and a head. Delve with the knife, thou wise man. This is the meaning. The butcher's knife and block is a symbol for the five cords of sensual pleasure. Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, provocative of lust. Odors cognizable by the nose, that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust, flavors cognizable by the tongue, that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Tangibles cognizable by the body, that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with desi sensual desire and provocative of lust. Throw out the butcher's knife and block. Abandon the five cords of sensual pleasure. 
delve with the knife, thou wise man. This is the meaning. Next one is the piece of meat. The piece of meat is a symbol for delight and lust. Throw out the piece of meat, abandon delight and lust, delve with the knife, thou wise man. This is the meaning. And the Naga serpent is the symbol for um, a bhikkhu who has destroyed the tanks. Leave the Naga serpent. Do not harm the Naga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. This is the meaning. So the Buddha essentially, he just unravels this riddle. And the basic pieces are all there. We can go back over the list and see them and think of them in our own practice and pay more attention to them. So when we're talking about our practice, we look at, we say, ignorance is the problem, but the core piece, you know, ignorance, we, it goes like this. The Buddha says, craving is the cause of suffering. And we immediately want to add, add on to this when we start practicing. Obviously, ignorance is a big problem. But what was the real piece, the real piece that causes the ignorance to be there, the craving, I'm sorry, the craving. What is the real piece that trips off the craving? It's I, I, playing with the I. Don't take this self and no self and run away and hide or throw the book away and say no more Buddhism. This is all ridiculous. It's not about that. The self and no self is one of what I consider one of the worst translations could have ever happened in Buddhism without speaking further. Okay, if you say self and no self and you start speaking further, you're okay. But if you say self and no self, you want to run away. And the psychologists are coming close behind, probably with machetes trying to chase you down because of the ego that you're going to destroy the ego. And yet I'm over here in India and I've been all over the place and the kids are just great. Their egos are just fine. You know, the egos are just great. So what was the problem? The problem was the consequence of looking at life as if it's all about me. And the moment you do that, you have to defend yourself. So you are defending and fighting all the time and the weight of the world is on top of you and you don't know what to do with it. It's pressing down on you in so many ways and then all of the competition to be like everyone else, get there first, compete, everything like that. There's nothing wrong with competition, don't misunderstand me, but if you live your whole entire life based on you know, competition, something's really wrong you know, because you're totally exhausted. And the sad part about it, there's a wonderful little book um, about the caterpillars. And caterpillars, it's about, it's a corporate book. It was around Washington, D.C. for a long time. And you get this little book, somebody would give it to you because you're totally exhausted at trying to be the best CEO, the top dog in the company, or you're trying to have the best company outdo everybody else. And the funny part is you're trying to climb this, this pillar to get to the top, you see? But when you're climbing up the pillar, you have to step on other people's heads and knock them off the pillar and push them off and everything. And you get to the top of the pillar and you look over the top of the pillar over there at the dramas that are going on on top of the pillar between the people. And you think, wait a minute, something's terribly wrong. I'm going to the top of the pillar. I've been working my whole life to get to the top of the pillar. And now the dramas, the problems, conflicts, arguments, lying, cheating, stealing, and everything is going on at the top of the pillar. How can this be? You're totally shook now because now that you're on the top of the pillar, you're afraid somebody's gonna take it away too. But you're so confused in relationships, in everything that you were confused in at the bottom of the pillar. So the question is, what are you supposed to do with this? Where are you supposed to go? 
see. So this is food for thought because what would it be like if we threw I out for a while and pretended, you know, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not my song. I'm not going to tell you that's what it is and that's what it has to be. I don't care what you do with it. But, you know, if you start playing with this, life is a lot easier if you figure out that you can live in a different angle with life. You see, that's the whole thing. None of what we teach here, you can ask May. <laughs> None of this that we're teaching here, do we say you have to swallow it, you have to keep it or the rest of it. You know, we must do the Kalama Sutta, what, four times a year? We do that at least a couple times a year so that you listen to the Kalama Sutta and don't believe anything I say. I'm just saying, look at what he figured out take it home and try it, you know, see what it's like to go to work and with have a lousy relationship with somebody at work and get in an incident. And when you come home that night, on one page, you write down what the incident was. Okay. And on the other page, you write it down again, but put yourself in another position where nothing was taken personally that was put to you. And then tell me if you would have done the incident the same way. Tell me if you would have, if you would have figured it out uh, the same way, what would, how would you have handled it? And most of my students are going to tell me, oh, it's totally different. Sure it is. It's totally different. This experiment, the Buddha did not say, I taught this and we're in this generation, accept everything in all these books that everybody has and do that. He didn't do that. No, he didn't. He told us basically in his system of school, his school that was floating around India, if you do not practice basing your practice and investigation on what you believe only based on knowledge and vision, if you do not accept my approach of examining things by direct knowledge. I don't want you to stay in the school. You can leave. I don't want you to talk to other monks about this. Just leave. There are incidences like that. You see? He only thing he asked you to do was attempt to repeat his line of investigation. By following the four noble truths, and looking closely at where is the suffering and what is the cause of it and what is it like if there, it isn't there anymore and what could be, everything was hypothetical. What could be the solution to this suffering to change it? That's what he did. He did that with arbitration with kings, with arbitration with generals. He did it arbitration with two different kingdoms, you know, across the river one time. And it's all through the text that he was using the Four Noble Truths for an arbitration technique. Yeah. So you need to tell me what comes up for you with the riddle. Do you see what's going on with the riddle? Let's come back to the riddle. So floor is open. Questions? Hello, Jens. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Paul, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> yeah. You have a question? I, I know, I, I was just uh, uh, I'm greeting you. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Yeah, all right. You're welcome, okay. Right. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Anybody have a question about what we did with the riddle? Ever, it's there. He wrote yes. it down. I saw it. What I, are you up to, Everett? I uh, I, I have a question <clears throat> about the the order. So the mm. sin as the five hindrances. Uh huh. Um, but before the two before that are also two hindrances. So are those just uh, added for like extra effect? Like those are. Especially yeah, well, <laughs> always remember the hindrances, uh, you know, the five, you have the five hindrances, okay? And they're like um, the five 
root hindrances is the way this is set up. Now, if you, do you have the book? Do you have the book with you? No, you don't have the book. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's a book. Yeah. Oh, you do have the book. Okay. Do you have, is 128 in your book? One, number 128? If you go to 128, I'll show you what happens here. 128 is Upak Kalesa Sutta. And if you go there, you're playing with 11 hindrances all of a sudden. See? So what's the deal? What's happening? So if you look at that one, you get a clearer picture of why would there be more than five hindrances? So let's look at those real quick. And in here, um, we can mark off, as I read them, I'll read them to you, okay, the list. And when you write them, write them down, then you can check off the five and see all the extra ones, okay? Okay, so the first one in Upak Kalesa is doubt. Okay, that's on, are you on, in the Majima Nikaya, it's on page 1012, 1012. Got it, okay. It's in section 16. So the first one that he has there, he says doubt arose in me, okay. And then the second one he lists is inattention, inattention. Now, of course, inattention is like restlessness, isn't it? So it's a subcomponent for restlessness, probably. And then this, the third one he mentions is sloth and torpor. That's one of the standard ones. So you can make a little, um, you know, make a little star or something beside them when they're their regular one. Then the fourth one is fear arose, fear. So that's, um, you could figure out later, figure it out later, which is the subcomponent of somebody else. The next one is elation, which is a subcomponent again, okay? And then after elation, you have inertia, okay? And after that, you have an excess of energy. There's your restlessness again, right? But then you have one below that deficiency of energy, which should probably be a subcomponent of sloth and torpor. Could be. Then you've got uh, longing. And longing is like, Longing to get to Nibbana. Yeah. Longing to get to Nibbana. Yeah. And it happens like the seventh or eighth day. It can happen in a retreat. If we catch you doing it, we poke you. <laughs> Say, don't do that. Try to keep sitting. Okay. Just sit. Um, next one is perception of diversity which makes your mind go all over the place. So it's kind of a subcomponent, I guess, of restlessness. And then um, excessive meditation upon forms is the last one. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 11 11th one is excessive meditation upon forms. Wow, well, you're at the beach. She's there. You can't take your eyes off her. And, <laughs> you know, you can just stare, stare, stare. And this can be for a woman with a guy or a man with a guy, uh, with a woman, whatever. And you just there, you know, and excessive forms, excessive meditation upon forms can also mean what it actually seems like excessive meditation. And we, I had a retreat. I had a retreat in, uh, I taught in September last year with 16 nuns. And what happened, oh, this is really funny. I had to, I had to just, um, they were doing meditation really hard and they had all of them, all of them had gone from 30 minutes to three to four hours of meditation. They were working really hard and very successful, okay? But what happened was outside <laughs> these big gardens by the convent, uh, all of the flowers, I don't know how they figured out how to plant them so they would do this, but all these flowers that had these were the basic flowers for perfumes in the world. 
you know, they all came out at the same time. And everybody was coming into the Dhamma Hall and they were like, you could see it. They just wanted to go outside and walk in the garden. So I said, okay, there's no more meditation today. You can do go out, take a day off. And I gave it to them. It's the same reason that Bhante had given, my teacher had given us a day off once when uh, we were in a retreat on the mountain, the first location we were at in, in Missouri. And um, the, the, that old location. And we just were exhausted. We just wanted to stop. We wanted to go out because the weather was perfect. And so he comes in the morning to breakfast. He says, there's nothing to do today. Everybody take a day off and just keep smiling for the day. And the story goes that that night we came back for the Dhamma talk. We all went down the bottom of the mountain. We went swimming in the river, had a few adventures, came back up the mountain. And we were there for the Dhamma talk. And, um, <laughs> you know, um, Bhante says, so, so how was your day off? And we told him what we did. And, and he said, did you all keep smiling? And he said, and we all said, oh yeah, we were smiling all day. And he said, good meditation, huh? That's all he said. And he sat there and we looked at each other and Erwin popped up. He says, no, we didn't meditate. He said, yeah, but you did. You kept smiling all day, no matter what happened. There were certain things that happened that day that were really scary. I mean, there was, <laughs> we put Kelly in the river to swim. And uh, as she was swimming from the creek that was running out into the river, as she was swimming out to the river, she didn't see it. We all saw it. Must have been a water moccasin snake that went by about five feet long in front of her. And then she just kept swimming out. And we just all went like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> what have we done? <laughs> you know, and nobody got hurt, uh, but there were some fun things that happened that day. Yeah. So the whole thing was he once, he was from the very beginning, Bonte was trying to get across to us that this practice is not something we are teaching you for the retreat. This practice is something we want it to go in your pocket and be going all the time in your life. This is what is changing people's lives. This is what is really changing the idea that I could smile all day. The idea that I could play with whatever happens, like when the water doesn't come or the dog doesn't get out in time or, you know, or the electricity goes out for more than the time I can deal with it. You know, I just start laughing. This place is full of that. You know, yesterday we had no electricity all day. A few days before we had no water for three days in a row. We were bucketing it up from somebody else's uh, street. That's because they just decide, you know, with all these people packed in where I live, they just decide to cut all the trees for the electric lines in one day, one whole day. And so they just, they, they did it three, it worked so well the first day, they did it a second day and a third day. And I'm there like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> what are you doing? And then it hits 100 degrees. And I'm there like, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm sane. I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> That's why, am I going to Poland? That's, that's why I'm leaving. I'm going to Poland. Okay, here I go. So anyway, um, this, is, this is what you just laugh at things that go on. Because why? Because, because it's all floating by you. I mean, it's all, well, actually, it's on the floor. Where is it? Here's the little car. Okay, here's the car. And it's, it's just going, it's going, it's going, going along. See? I'm going backwards again. May I have to turn this mirror thing around? <laughs> it's going, going this direction. And if you're, if you're, why do you have to pick things up and put them in, in the, oops, wait, put them in the trunk? Why do you have to do that? You don't have to. You can just stay in the little car in the present time and enjoy yourself. It's, it's not hard. Yeah. But you have to understand people are going to think you're weird but that's okay that's fine <laughs> it's a weird world yeah question may um yeah sister kema if i may um i was looking at the uh foot is footnote uh 275 um yeah on page uh one two one three 
Um, and I thought that was interesting uh, that uh, the, the um, uh, history behind who Venerable Kumara Kasapa was. And here it says, at the time this sutta was delivered, he was still a seka. So that was my first question, what is a seka? Then my second question was, he attained a arahatship using this sutta as his subject of meditation. So how exactly did he use this sutta as his subject of meditation? Okay, which what, which note was it? Sutta 23, which one? Uh, the Two, first, so 275. 275, okay, okay. Yeah. Wait a minute. Note number 275. Yes. He, he was an adopted son of King Pasanati of Kosala. Is that what you're reading? Yes. Okay, born of a woman who, not knowing she was pregnant, had gone forth as a bakuni. Oh, I remember that story. After having conceived him. Mm. Um, and at the time the sutta was delivered, he was still a, a seka. Seka is another word for, um, I think we looked that back, but I think it's a look at it back. He, saw, he may have been a person in white. At the time the sutta was delivered, he was still a seka. Probably means he was in white because it's not saying Samanera. So, but if you go to the back and look up Seka, you probably find that Bhikkhu Bodhi likes to do that. <laughs> he likes to tell you something in a note. And you're like, what's a Seka? Okay, let's go find a Seka. <laughs> okay, let's see. Find a Seka in here somewhere. But I think there is one word that was Seka was listed. Um, maybe not. We'll see. By the way, if anybody's like me, which you're probably not, but you go get Childer's Dictionary, it's much easier because at my age, you don't wanna change the alphabet. <laughs> and if you get a Childer's Dictionary, it's a wonderful poly dictionary, just as good as Rice Davies, but it's all A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So there's no big, big tough thing to change things around. So there it is, Seka, a disciple in higher training. Ah, disciple in higher training. He was a Seka at that time. Okay, so probably what it means, wait a minute, did, she, did they say it was before he was still a Seka? Disciple in higher training, tamed arahatship using this sutta as his subject of meditation. Okay, so it means he's a monk in serious higher training, okay? Attempting to become um, an arahat, you know, attempting to go through all the way for all of the attainments, okay? That's what it means. And so he uses the sutta as a subject for meditations. You want to see how you do that? Is that what you're asking? How would you do that? Well, let's go back and, and see again where we are looking at the pieces of this. Okay. And. Hmm. Okay. Okay, where is the explanation? The explanation is what you need. So if you lay this down, Everett probably did it pretty well when he took notes, right? So if you, 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 um, you lay this down in the order that it was happening. And you know how I told you to write down each one? And then we looked at what it, the Buddha said each one represented, okay? And see what the, how much of the teaching you can find in it. And he's using it as a framework to he memorize the riddle. So when he's going through, it's like his path. So if it was his path, what does he get out of it? Okay, so the first one, he gets to understand his body, right? He understands his body is made up of material form and the four great elements, and he understands that. So he understands uh, the section in um, Maha Tanha Sankhaya Sutta 38. He understands the section in that sutta that explains where the whole thing started. You know what I'm talking about? Right. Okay. And then the actions one undertakes day, uh, by day and night speech, he gets exercises from this. He gets a set of drills. Okay, that's what I liked about this. Um, you know, is the first one is actions you take 
during the day of body, speech, and mind after thinking and pondering by night is the flaming of the day. And before that, one thinks and ponders by night based upon one's actions in the day. So he gets to test that. You can see how he goes out and he tests it. See, people think they're going out and sitting and that's all they're doing. That's not what's happening. Because if you were to tear down the Medina Nikaya every time you saw a drill, you would come out with a set of about, I don't know, I think there's about 34 of them or something like that, 34 or more than that. And throughout this text that are drills for people to practice, you see? So um, this would be testing out for yourself that if I'm uh, thinking and, and pondering and waking up and sleeping, waking up and sleeping at nighttime, whoo, that's uh, fuming at night. And, uh, and what I did during the day, that's affecting what I'm thinking about at night. This is somebody who goes to bed and doesn't turn off before they go to sleep. You've heard me say at the beginning of a retreat, we give you instructions. Uh, when you go to lie down to go to sleep, uh, you give yourself an instruction. I will wake up in the morning at six o'clock or five o'clock, uh, you know, with a smile on my face. I, I will wake up with a smile in the morning and I'm going to go to sleep now. Go to sleep. You say to your mind, go to sleep. What, what are we doing with this meditation? What is it really accomplishing? Ah, my nuns, they were really good at this. They said, you know what's happening to us? And I said, what? It wasn't me. I, it was really them. We are opening up a system of communication between ourselves and our mind that was shut down, but was always inside of us. Ah, oh, it's very good, I said, very good. You got the contract to open up the communication at system at West Point. <laughs> now we're giving you the contract to open up the communication system that's naturally inside the human body. So that when you have an inclination, your mind goes. This is the birthplace of manifestation. You know that? This is the birthplace of turning on manifestation for the person, okay? Um, so that you can manifest things, so that you can connect. So if I start to think about somebody, they knock at the door in five, 10 minutes, you see? I've had some crazy stuff happen in the last two months. All right, so that's the kind of thing like that, okay? Now, here's one, the Brahmin, the Brahmin is a symbol for the Tathagata. So the, this is when you have a problem and you're in training, you're a Sekha, you go to the Tathagata or you go to one of the higher monks to get it defined. Famous entering, da 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 da. You know, here's Sariputta, here's Kohita, here's the other one, the other one. There's a whole bunch of Gandanya, there's a whole bunch of them. Okay, so you go and get it clarified. Yeah, one of the things you're supposed to learn when you're practicing, uh, when you're in the camp of the Buddha, is don't let him go to bed. <laughs> With so many suttas where he comes out and he says something, and then he says, uh-huh, and he goes to bed because they're sitting there listening and they didn't ask a question. And then who is it? Who's the one monkey always comes out? Uh, Koh no, it's not Kohita. I think it's a different one. Um, I don't remember who it is, but he always shows up and he says, okay, okay, okay. I'll tell you what the Buddha said. I'll explain it to you. I will expound on it. But first, because I'm a senior monk, I have to scold you. Why are you so dumb that you let the Buddha go to bed when he was telling you something and you wanted to understand it? You're not supposed to do this. This is the Buddha and he's here. Yeah? So when he's here, you're supposed to listen very closely to what he says and pay attention, yeah? So don't let him go to bed, but I'll explain it to you. And then he explains it. And he does this about three, four times in suttas that are in the Majjhima Nikaya. Then it says, oh, the wise one uh, is a symbol for the monk, the Sekha, the Sekha in training. Okay, that's the wise one. The knife is a symbol for noble wisdom. If you are wise, you will investigate persistently. You will continue to ask questions. And this is very difficult for us in Asia to get people to ask questions. It's very tricky because the systems of schooling in Asia, wherever there has been hmm, the British or the Dutch or the Portuguese, 
and the people have been oppressed. Now it's in their DNA. Don't ask questions, just do as you're told. And the education systems that are left from the British uh, conquest in this area, like India, have in, that's in the system. And in, in Sri Lanka, a couple years back, they said they're ripping out the whole system. They're getting rid of the older teachers and bringing new teachers in, encouraging them to ask students to ask questions. But for heaven's sakes, it's 2022. And this is like 2020 or something. They decided to think about doing that. But they've had a terrible problem with the people being the ones that are hired into Western companies coming into these countries. And the reason into responsible positions, into working positions, sometimes lower management positions, okay, but not into upward mobility type of positions in Western companies. Because why? Because they're not, they don't think they're innovative. And it's not that they don't, they're not innovative people who would ask questions and figure out better ways for the company to do things. That's what they want. But it's not that they're not that way. It's that they have no practice doing that. And when somebody like me comes along who went into school in kindergarten was pushed to ask questions all through kindergarten, first through sixth grade, and then in high school and then in college. You see, you're talking to a group of people that weren't allowed to ask questions until after high school. And this is, that's what's happening. It took me two years to figure out that's what was happening in Sri Lanka in the universities when I was working, teaching meditation at uh, one of the universities uh, in uh, Colombo because I couldn't get them to ask questions. So that's it. And then I'm slow because it took me, what, three more years at least before I figured out if I give them sticky notes at the retreats, here are the sticky notes, here are the pens, write your question and stick it on the back of my whiteboard. And I would collect the questions every day and then answer questions every evening. So what happened? The 16 nuns asked 49 questions in 10 days. And why was that a good thing? Because they weren't walking around meditating, thinking about the answer to a question that they couldn't ask. They, they didn't do that. But the other people who weren't asking questions were not practicing the meditation only. They were wanting to ask questions, you see? So this is why this is all so important. So the knife is the symbol for the noble wisdom, and that's the asking questions, asking, cutting, asking more, 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 the knife, okay? The bar is a symbol of ignorance, okay? And that's where you stop asking questions. <laughs> that's pretty good, okay? And then the toad is the one for anger and irritation. You start watching, you started watching. What happens in my mind when anger and irritation arises, what changes in my body and my mind? And what changes is your tension and tightness starts to happen. There's tension and then there's stress you see arising. If so, if there's something happening repeatedly in your behavior, you're discovering, he was dis investigating, discovering his patterns of behavior that were repeating over and over and over again. He was looping. Everybody is looping where you, you do one thing in a reaction. So it fits this, the first thing, the first incident where it happened, but the, that incident's in the past. But you have another incident that happens that's similar to it. You react, 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 react. And that's, it wasn't hard for the, psychologists, investigators, psychological investigators or neurologists to figure out that the people are reacting about 85% of your living time. You're reacting, you're not responding. You're just replaying. And then he figures this out by examining anger and irritation. The fork is a symbol for doubt. Yeah, the fork just simply means like this is a fork. A forked stick can just mean this, okay? And if you're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth about something, you need to just let go and keep continue to um, 
continue to uh, uh, investigate, to practice, okay? That's what you need to do, you see? Okay, then the, four, the sieve, now this is the sieve, and it, you think about a sieve, you have a sieve, he, he, all the monks have sieves. It's one of the prerequisites. You've got a razor. Uh, they didn't have safety pins, but now they all have safety pins. <laughs> <laughs> but you got a razor and you got a sieve and you got a cup, okay? So what are you doing with this sieve? People, these uh, hindrances fall in the sieve and you start shaking it and you go try to let them go, but you're repeating them, repeating them, repeating them. He, he discovers that. And if he's listening to the teaching by the Buddha, he's going to hear it repeatedly, abandon them, abandon them, abandon them. And then he's learning what? He's learning about letting go of Atta. See, if you start to try to fight with your hindrances, you started to fight with them. That's me. That's I started to fight with them. See, that doesn't work. None of these verbs work without a pronoun. So if you fight, I fight. So step back and see what the difference is. And he starts practicing ways. This is what he was doing, practicing the opposite. So it gives him an excuse to practice the opposite on that. The tortoise is the five aggregates affected by clinging. Now he gets to watch the effect of when he is clinging, holding on to something, not letting go of it, what happens to him with his body feeling perception thoughts and consciousness how does it affect that and he gets to watch that and let go one of the beautiful things that is happening with delson giving talks when you listen to delson's talks is he took the jhana uh, and basically said you know we had said that they were um levels of understanding and he changed it to levels of cessation and i really do like that because that's exactly what's happening levels of cessation are occurring each jhana you go through some people were looking at it more like um, the deeper i go the more complex and great i am because i am the deepest dumb you know the deepest depths of the jhanas and i am you know, and i'm there like what is that about it's one of the guarantee on, you know, warranty card, I'll give it to you. You ain't going to Nibbana, honey. <laughs> it's not happening, you know, because you're going on this grandiose opinion of yourself being in the jhanas. Let it go. You know, jhana is like this catch word. As soon as we had this word pop up, you know, I my favorite story, my favorite story, you've heard me tell it before is the woman that walked into the interview in South Korea. And I was auditing the interview. So Bonte's across the room and she's facing him. I have her back to me and she gets down in front of him. So what's, how's it going? He says, and she says, well, I listened to your instructions for the first two days, but they don't impress me because I already have the first, uh, the fourth jhana. I got the first, fourth jhana. And he looked at her, you know, and I, I perked up and wondered, how's he going to handle this? Because she's got the fir, fourth jhana in her pocket, you know. <laughs> That's what she was basically coming across. I've got, already got the first fourth jhana. And, and he had to explain, no one had told her about Anicca. And no one had told this woman what Anicca meant. And every state that you experience, every time you sit, it's never going to be the same. So the person who's struggling to repeat what happened yesterday is going to have a bad day and tell you about it tomorrow because he can't do it. You know, he can't, he cannot make it happen again. It doesn't work that way. Okay. And, and she was adamant and she was angry at him that he would not accept that she already had the fourth jhana. Why are we talking about the first, second, and third one if I have the fourth jhana? obviously she didn't because there wasn't any equanimity in it at all you know she was actually angry so <laughs> i don't know so it, it's the different ways that people look at all of this 
And, and then the person that came to the retreat in, uh, I guess it was Jayamangala Jaya in Indonesia with me. And every night at the Dhamma talk, every night at the precise time when questions start, she would raise her hand. But Sister came in, when are you going to tell us how to stop the suffering? <laughs> But I mean, you're giving them this Dhamma talk and you're attempting to teach them again and again. And, they, and the, every night, the same question. Well, the third night, the, it was an interesting experience because everyone else was dressed in a very comfortable sort of yogi clothing. But this person would go to her suitcase and dress herself up in her finest silken garments, like a beautiful, beautiful suit and come to the Dhamma talk, a different one each night. I like silk, you know, it's small. You can do that. <laughs> small, small suitcase for a retreat. You can do that. Bring in six sets of clothes. But anyway, she would come every night completely dressed up to ask that question. Like she wasn't even hearing the Dhamma talk, wasn't even hearing the other questions and stuff. She just wanted, well, what she wanted was basically this. Um, she wanted this. In this box is the solution to suffering. And here it is. And I'm giving it to you for 1995. <laughs> Get it today. It's only available until tonight at 12 midnight. That's what it always says. <laughs> computer you only have until 12 o'clock to get this and this is the answer to suffering you know and i kept finally i said i'm really sorry and she said why i said because there's no boutique here and uh, there's no shops and there's nowhere that you can go to get the latest fashion of no suffering no place to go I didn't know what else to tell her. She sat down immediately and I, I, and she didn't ask me after that. She didn't ask me the fifth night and the sixth night. She didn't ask it four, four times. She asked me before I said that, but then she kind of got it. It's not something I can buy. And she wanted it instantly. And I, that was the night it hit me. We're going to be dealing with people who want instant gratification immediately take all my suffering away from me give me the pill so nothing happens anymore and we don't have the pill yet of course we could go to the pharmaceutical companies i'm sure they'd figure it out after covid they probably would do it you know <laughs> i don't know but we we don't have that pill yet okay so what's the next one this we did the sieve and the tortoise and then he goes the butcher's block one for this person who wants to use it as a where the question is can i use this as a map for my development he's doing pretty well now wouldn't you say he's doing pretty well and then the butcher's knife and block is a symbol for the five cords of sensual pleasure and that's pretty easy to keep uh examining the rising up of, of the essential desire and provocative of lust and studying how lust arises. Now, in the process of this, remember, he was in the camp, in the school, so he's obviously getting the baseline core foundation training, right? With all the other monks. You got to remember that, May, okay? So so he's he's getting the stuff about the five aggregates and the three kinds of feeling and the example of the seven links of dependent origination. How is everything happening from contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies for reaction and birth of reaction? They're probably, he's experimenting with all of that, okay? As he goes along. So he's getting a pretty good education with this thing. It just hit him the right way to take this one. He could have used 137, you know, or he could have used another one which are maps, one, I think it's 137, it's like a map, so I think that's the right one. Um, let me check for a second, but you could have used that one. Let me note on that. Yeah, 137 or 138, maybe it's 138. Sister came on where I was trying to come from was, I guess he was using it, like you say, um, as a, as a, as a re reflecting on it as part of, um, the day-to-day -day practice versus 
um, let's say someone's using um, the Chachaka Sutta and drilling that way would be a different way of drilling. Yeah, the parts of this are pointing. He's going to figure out, I don't help myself, but the I doesn't help me too much. He's going to figure that out. He's going to stumble across it, you know, but he's probably also hearing other suttas and everything in training the way they were doing this. It was pretty rigorous as far as when you start to really research the framework of the school, the, the school was like going in and uh, mother is there, Sariputta is waiting and takes you and gives you your robes and your bowl and starts teaching you the, the uh, basic rules and how to live with everybody, like the lessons we see in 128 and some other places about how to get along, blending like milk and water and not, not being trouble if some for each other you're living in a group commune now all of a sudden okay and he's learning about going for alms and everything and then he's helping the person for the breathing meditation to calm down and then get started with their practice to get through one two three and four the rupa jhanas as soon as you get to the fourth jhana ding ding go over to mogalana there's the nurse and the nurse takes you through um infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and is there available all the time to answer your questions. You don't come back to the mother. Now you've got the basic stuff. And um, yeah, and so part of the basic stuff is understanding there's a lot of this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And that's, that's the Atta training. So if you're even just talking about Satipatthana, Satipatthana is helpless if it stands alone. I hate to say that because I know there's a lot of people who just want it and nothing else. I know, but there is no one sutta in my opinion. This is an IMHO, hello. <laughs> okay, it's my, in my humble opinion. Okay, um, there is no one sutta out of 84,000 suttas that's gonna give you the whole complete training. And Satipatthana doesn't do it either because you have to ha have the basis to understand the sections in Satipatthana clearly enough. And you can go to Maha Satipatthana Sutta and examine it again. You still have to have the basic pieces in order to really understand why are I doing these different sections. For instance, one of the mistakes today is if you feel that's the only thing you need is when they give the... the um, Cemetery contemplation to somebody who just got married. Frankly, I'd like to just kill them when they do that. <laughs> you know, because I mean, come on, let the person get married, let them have their married life, okay, and have their children. Why would you, it's not very compassionate to do this to a young married couple that's just getting married. It's not necessary. It's a good idea to teach them the 30, 31 is it 31 or 32? I can't remember. Parts of the body. It's a good idea to teach them about that. Yeah, but it's not necessary to give them the cemetery contemplation as a drill to do for, you know, the question is, should we go to the class on the cemetery contemplation or should we go to Disneyland? That's what I ran into in Florida. And I'm sweeping by the temple and they asked me that. I said, go to Disneyland. <laughs> you know, they had just gotten married three days before. I mean, why do you want to go in there when you know that he's teaching you the cemetery contemplation and you're here on your honeymoon and you have Disneyland or this class? I'm there. Why are you even asking me? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry. This is not compassionate. It's not compassionate. It's um, there are certain things that today they weren't there in this cultural structure back then, you know? Uh, yeah, there's certain things that we have to figure out what to say to people about things. You go too far in your practice. The, the question is, should everybody go how far in their practice? Well, it's up to the individual. But if they don't know what they're getting into, this can be a problem. And then, they, you know, you have the person come and say, what happened to my relationship? And I'm there, well, Nobody explained things to you and now you're coming to me and you're wanting me to talk to you about this and I, I can explain it to you but the thing is if you go too far in the, in, in the practice without 
using it. I want to teach people that want to use it in life. And that's what I tell people in my retreats. I want to give it to the people. Those nuns, they took it. They did it. They kept it going. A month later on review, they were still sitting. It was wonderful. You know, three or four hours um, in prayer, in personal prayer to God to help people. That's what they were doing. Now, this was an experiment. This was a bridge work project, meaning I had to teach the whole course and not be Buddhist, <laughs> but I was wearing robes. <laughs> that was okay. So the first night of that retreat, I had to do a class on the 10 commandments and the uh, precepts. And actually nine there are nine pre parts to our precepts that match nine parts of the of the Ten Commandments, and the only one missing is the dependence on a higher super being. You know, I will uh, will not uh, pray to any other god but you, but God. Okay, that's it. That first first commandment, but the rest of the commandments and the difference in the system is I'm commanding you. Well, I'm telling you. If you don't follow the precepts, that the practice isn't going to work, number one. But this is no different. I'm being honest with you. If you go back to the five precepts, if you don't put the five fluids in your car, don't expect to be able to go on vacation and not have problems. You've got to have gas. You got to have oil. You got to have steering fluid. You got to have brake fluid. And you got to have transmission fluid. And I don't even care about a Tesla car. You got to have this in the car. You see, whether it's electric or not, most of this still applies. So it's so that you have a good drive in your car. So you become the model car. You know, it's the Paul Chin model car. And we have to give the fluids into your car or you, you can't drive. What are you going to do on the LA freeway when you're stuck with 20,000 cars and you can't move any faster than three to five miles an hour, you see, and you don't have brake fluid, you're going to crash with their from hit you from behind and the front, <laughs> you're going to get stuck. Or what about if you don't have the transmission fluid in what you it's low and it goes out when you're on an interstate highway, you're stuck. So this is all about from my perspective, what I'm teaching you is how does this stuff operate? That's what I stick to. If you, you're hanging out with me, that's what this is about. And the big one is, can you learn to live more in peace than in war and uh, with each other? And can you learn how to use the tools that the Buddha gave us in far as arbitration we were talking about earlier um, in the beginning class? Can you learn to use these these things that the Buddha has given us to live in life better. It's really cool to be able to use these things. And what's the benefit of this? Well, the benefit is other people are walking around, they have no idea how stuff works. And you're walking around and if there's kind of a, a problem, it doesn't phase you when the guy comes in the morning in the building and you're all there workers. And the joke was like, say, uh, say Everett gets a job there in this warehouse. He's the only one that is uninformed. <laughs> Everybody else is ready for this guy to come in the morning, the supervisor. And um, nobody ever says good morning to, him, but Everett's new and he doesn't know. So Everett says, good morning, sir. And the guy stands there and he goes, exactly what do you mean by that? <laughs> and ever doesn't know what to say when he says that and ever, it's sort of the trick the trick question is like everybody else knew this was going on with this person see that person he doesn't understand how things are working in the world and there's so much suffering that you can help people with you know as far as depression and grief and just the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair right now in understanding it's okay to cry. You know, men, it's okay to cry. Yeah, everybody, men are not different than women. You know, I got these little holes in my eyes right here, like little ducks say, like tears come out. And if you look real close in the mirror, I think you're going to have them too. <laughs> 
Yeah, that was the model. They did that that part right. Everybody has tear ducts and it's fine to cry. But to let things completely overcome you and pull you out of the uh, present time is what is sad to see how that happens with people when things start to fall apart. And to teach them a simple lesson anybody can teach is the past, the future, and the present time and understanding what's true about the past and what's true about the future and uh, why the present time makes life easier. If you can stay in the little car and go towards down the life continuum line and not and remember to keep your trunk closed in the car when you're moving along the road because when things happen in the past they become they should fall into the past as you go by them but for some reason we tend to put pick them up and put them in the trunk and take them with us and then you have grandma or somebody sitting in the rocking chair at home and rocking and what's going on why are you crying well i'm because your dad and you know that happened and it was like 10 years ago and oh my god <laughs> and she's falling apart again but the question is she thinks she is reliving the emotions of that event but you know that she is taking today's energy and she's using that for her upset situation if you can teach her just that lesson then she knows she gets a cup of energy every day and she should be careful not to get lost in the past because she's sucking away today's energy to feed that memory you see and if she's overly worried about the future just come on Graham. let's go get some ice cream or cookies and not worry about what might happen then you have to teach her the story of chicken little <laughs> teach her the story of chicken little and we all know chicken little wouldn't go out of the barn because he was so afraid the sky might fall and he wouldn't go out in the rain because he was afraid the lightning might happen he ends up dying you know it's a bad story you know really <laughs> chicken died but that's what happened to chicken little he didn't understand anything you know so getting this knowledge this knowledge and vision of how things actually work gives a buddhist person an edge gives you an edge to not get upset and to let things go and stay in the present time that's what it is okay so i gotta get ready now because oh boy i gotta go do a marriage tonight i don't marry them I just wish him luck. <laughs> I give him blessings and wish him luck. And uh, so it's kind of fun, you know, but um, I have to go tonight. And last week I was naming babies. <laughs> I was naming babies. So now we have, a, let's see, we have an abhe. That means the uh, brave hearted, uh, brave hearted boy. And uh, then we have Sophie. We have Sophie. There was a Sophie actually in the in the poly. There was a Sophie. It's S O P H A E. Isn't that neat? It's different, you know. And that one is quick, clever girl. <laughs> quick and clever girl. So she's very, very clever. And she's really sweet. Oh my gosh. So I have fun doing that. And then yesterday, what happened yesterday? Oh yeah, they put up a 50 foot flagpole in the sun. Uh -huh. I'll point that out. <laughs> I wasn't willing to climb up on the thing where the flagpole was. I stood at the bottom. I looked like a sort of a dwarf that showed up, <laughs> you know, cause all these people are standing. Actually, I saw the pictures afterwards. It looks like they put me on a chair. I thought it turned out rather well because I was on the ground and they were on a thing like way up here. So yeah, it's kind of fun. <laughs> so I hope you all have a good week. You have more questions, you know where to send them, okay? And uh, if you, uh, now I'm probably, I will let you know, I am probably going to fly out of here at the end of this week. And, but we've already made arrangements, Tama Gavesi and I, so we have the, you know, the classes will continue. 
and I'll still work with him because after all, in order for me to order ice cream when I'm in India, I have to call Sri Lanka. So what a difference does it make if I'm in Poland and I want ice cream, I gotta call Sri Lanka. <laughs> this is getting funnier and funnier. <laughs> you know, it was much easier than learning how to, um, you know, ask for ice cream. So <laughs> was to ask him to do that for me. So we have this wonderful cooperative relationship. <laughs> of ordering groceries and and things uh, from in an odd way so they're getting orders at big basket to send me heads of lettuce from somebody who lives in Sri Lanka I mean it's perfectly normal isn't it <laughs> I just love to travel I think it's really fun so I get to go I'll tell you all about it when I when I get there I'll probably they, they're already setting things up so I know we have good internet I know I have a private place where I, I can be separate from people and that's good. And um, everything is working very uh, smoothly so far. So there should be like um, three small retreats, two or three small retreats of 10 people each. And then at the end, there should be one open retreat for whoever wants to come in from wherever in Europe. And we will be stationed in Gdansk in Poland. That's where we're going to be stationed. And the pictures look good right now. Uh, he gave me a picture of a ballerina dancing on the street. So I think it's a crazy tale. <laughs> How long are you going to be in, in Gdansk? All the way until August. I'll come what, back what in time? August. We're what trying time? to, we are trying, well, it's on the edge of Gdansk. I don't know the name of right. where the Just, I'll, I'll be in. I'll be in Germany in July, August as well. And we are really oh, cool. close to the Polish border. And yeah, that's okay. not too far. I don't know how Europe works, but they think it's fun. You know, they say this is like a central point, a very central point to be, be in for people to come. And his clients and everything are coming from Portugal and UK and Italy. Yeah. And so they have this all figured out where there's this point and that's what they decided to put it there. And then he's talking about uh, building a location, a permanent location, because it's fairly easy to buy property in Poland, he said. So he's from yeah, Sweden. He's from Sweden. So yeah, it's going to be I'll, fun. I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay. Okay. Just drop me a note. So make sure that I have your email. It just said contikama2 at, at gmail.com. Send something okay. to me there. So I have yeah. it. It's good to know you're there. <laughs> That's very good. Okay. So uh, everybody have a good week. I'm glad to see you all. And um, we'll choose a good topic when we get over there. I'll let you know what's happening. Um, and um, keep in touch. Keep smiling. And let's do our prayer. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of habits. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. My bell is always happy if it gets hit. <laughs> you have a good week. Keep smiling. And the most important thing is remember to give your smiles away. It doubles the value and uh, makes other people. See you, sister. <laughs>